Good evening. Welcome to Central News for Wednesday the 4th of September. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Waikato District Health Board's first annual report focusing on maternity quality and safety confirms that a number of changes have taken place in recent months in response to an action plan introduced in September last year. There are now extra midwifery staff in delivery suites and in the women's assessment unit, an additional obstetrician and gynaecologist on staff, and more equipment to ensure clinical efficiency and timely patient care. Senior medical officers also now present after hours to support the operational environment and more lead maternity care and consumer engagement with the maternity quality and safety programme. Lake Roto Iti's water quality is the best it has been since monitoring began in 1991 as a result of the Rotorua Te Arawa Lakes programme. Water quality in six lakes has improved in the past year and water quality targets in several have been met or exceeded. Work to improve water quality is done in partnership with Bay Plenty Regional Council, Rotorua District Council and Te Arawa Lakes Trust. Bay Plenty Regional Council General Manager for Natural Resource Operations, Murray, uh, Murray Warwick, says while the annual results were promising, external factors such as climatic conditions could affect water quality from year to year. So it was important to look at the long-term trend in each lake. Now for our region's weather, Hamilton, your Thursday will have the odd morning shower and then fine. You'll have a strong cold southerly. Your expected high is 15 and an overnight low of 1. Thursday for you, Tauranga, an early shower, then fine too. And you also will have the cold gustily southerly too. Your expected high is 15 and an overnight low of 4. Just ahead, the paid parental leave bill. Welcome to Central News on TV Central. The six-month pay parental leave amendment bill had its first reading in Parliament on the 27th of July 2012. From the start, the odds were stacked against the bill, but several groups rallied the support and made sure their voices were heard. Although the bill has been blocked due to cost, John Key estimates $150 million extra a year. There is much debate over whether or not it will ever be extended. Tony Stevens from the Young Workers Resource Centre has been involved with the bill's submission to Parliament. We find out more. Hi Tony. So for those who are not familiar with your organisation, tell us a bit about the Young Workers Resource Centre. Well, we actually exist to support young people um, in regards to employment. So we actually fill a gap in the New Zealand education curriculum. So we go into secondary schools and, and training centres and educate them on employment relations, things like their minimum rights and obligations. And we also actually offer free advice via our drop-in centre that we have here. Um, and they can just come to us with any kind of employment related queries. Yeah. Now, your organisation has been involved with the extending paid parental leave bill and the uh, President, Megan Morris, presented the bill to Parliament. So currently, what kind of support is being offered to mothers? Well, obviously we have the current uh, maternity leave scheme um, and that offers about 14 weeks of paid parental leave to, to young parents, young mothers. Um, and so that's 14 weeks at paid at about, at the most, 480-ish a week, depending on how much uh, you were getting paid before you took leave. Um, and New Zealand is really at the bottom of the, uh, of the scale when we compare ourselves to other um, maternity leave entitlements from other countries in the OECD. We're actually the second lowest in, in the OECD. It's really bad. So if you, if you compare us to the UK, they actually have 39 weeks paid. Uh, and uh, Canada has about 50 weeks paid. Um, so yeah, we're just really, we, you know, we consider ourselves to be one of the fairest countries in the, in the world, but we're really behind the eight ball on this one. Now, why do you believe it is not beneficial to mothers to re-enter the workforce after just 14 weeks? Well, it's not just about mothers, actually. It really comes down to the baby's welfare. Um, 
they need to spend as much time with their mothers and their, and their fathers to an extent as well as possible, especially in that all-important first year. Um, their first year is such a race to develop, all their neural pathways are developing, and to really make the most of that, they need to spend as much time with mum as possible, and she needs to be as, as uh, not as stressed as possible. And she also, and, and research is showing that, that breastfeeding uh, is really crucial as well. It's really good for a, a good head start for young babies. So how is a, a young mother supposed to be able to breastfeed if she's having to go to, back to work after 14 weeks? You know, that, that all important first year is just vital. So this, this, this bill, it's, it's not a flight of fancy, it's not desirable, it's vital for, for the future of young Kiwis, yeah. Now the government have uh, come forward with a response and said that they cannot afford to extend the paid parental leave until 2015, so are you happy with this response? I don't know about happy, it's better than a kick in the rear, but uh, you know, it really needs, you know, to me it just shows that they're not really investing in the future of, of young New Zealand, they, you know, it shows me that um, investing in our, in our children is not really a priority to them. Um, you know, I want to see it happen now, it needs to happen sooner rather than later. And you know, the way that they're talking about vetoing it without even sort of considering the issue, you know, they haven't even talked about it, they just said, nah, we're going to veto it. Um, it just doesn't give me much confidence that 2015 is going to be the year that they, they look at it anyway. So I'm, I'm just quite sceptical around that. But, mm. Can anything else be done to perhaps bring forward the, that date? Well, I think anyone who supports this issue just really needs to stand up and, and talk about it and, and get it in front of John Key and you know, really push the issue as much as they can, really follow it as much as they can. Um, the 26 for babies. Um, group that sort of recently started to take flight um, is a good place to start for people who, who feel strongly about it. Um, if they can go onto their website and learn about them and their Facebook and they've actually got a, um, an e-postcard which they're, they're sending off in batches to the Prime Minister, if people can support that. Um, and they're also going around the country with that as well, so if you see them with it, definitely sign up for it, you know. So, yeah, just really pushing the issue. Continue to push it in front of them and don't, don't let go and don't get disheartened by the, um, the lack of discourse from government. Yeah. Can you paint a bit of a picture for us as to the negative impact you think will be from mums not staying home with their children? Well, it's pretty straightforward really. I mean, uh, if you think about a, a single mother or a really low income family um, having to go back after 14 weeks, you know, do they, you know, raising a baby is really hard. You know, a newborn, raising a newborn is really difficult. Um, if you add financial stress, financial burden to that um, equation, and you know, it's horrible. Um, and I just think, you know, like I said earlier, that all important first year is vital for their development. And if mum has to go back um, after 14 weeks, you know, that's just really gonna not be good for the baby. It's just not good enough, you know, they can go to daycare or whatever, but it's, you know, it's not the same, mm. yeah. Now when it comes to you and your family, how does this legislation directly impact you? <laughs> <laughs> well, my partner's just given birth um, to our first child last week. She's only a week old. Um, we are actually fortunate enough that I have just enough of an income to support us, um, but we're going to be tight. and. Uh, I think that my partner Georgie is actually going to have to go back to work sooner than, than she'd like and sooner than would be good for, for little Fallon, um, which is playing on our minds, but we really try not to think about it at the moment. So, I mean, if this, if this bill was applicable to us, which I don't think we're going to see in, in our the first year of our baby, it would be fantastic and it would really um, lighten the load, but yeah. Okay, so it's obviously impacting you directly. How can others support and find out more information? Mm. Well, like I said before, really good first step would be that 26 for Babies, and their website is www.26forbabies.org. Um, they're really pushing the issue um, really well. Uh, I think following them, supporting them, signing that e-postcard, and really educating yourself around it and learning why it's important um, to have that time, that extension and looking at what other countries have done and sort of asking the question, why is New Zealand at the bottom of the scale? You know, we're such a great country, but why are we behind on this issue? Mm. Coming up next, an anonymous forum for women to vent.
Welcome back. Anonymous Wife Diaries is a forum for women to let go of all their secrets online and anonymously. We chatted with website creator Erica Harvey to find out more about this popular website and why it has already attracted so many women from around the world. Um, Anonymous Wife Diaries is a site that's been designed to be a safe place where women can go to and talk about whatever is heavy on their mind or on their heart that they feel that they have nowhere else to go. Um, for example, a lot of women suffer from postnatal depression, but with a stigma around it, you don't really want to talk to your friends about it, you're kind of nervous. This is a place you can go, be anonymous, and meet other women that are going through the same things that can maybe help you, you know, on, help you develop through this journey that you're going through. So. You recently updated it. Yeah, um, we got a, a shareholder <laughs> into my business that makes no money, 25% um, in, in Hollywood, and they've taken it on board. They've redesigned the website. It's got more functionality. Um, it's easier to navigate, and so they're actually helping us to figure out this design to make it more suitable and interactive for people to interact with. Why did you want to create the website? Um, it's actually quite interesting, I guess. Um, when I was 26, I was diagnosed with cancer. And when I went through that, I was always quite positive and happy. And when you get diagnosed with something like that, your whole family freaks out. And so if you start telling them that you're scared or you're freaking out, then it makes it a lot more difficult. So you try to be strong for your family. Um, my husband and I were engaged at the time. so. What they didn't know is that at night I would cry myself to sleep or I was scared that if I went to sleep I wouldn't wake up. Um, I had panic attacks really badly. I couldn't even watch like my favorite TV shows like CSI or because when someone died I just I would palpitate. Um, so this kind of helped me. I thought if I had a place I could go to and meet other women or people that were going through you know, cancer and the diagnosis. Um, that would have made that whole journey so much easier because people try to connect with you but you go, I oh, have no idea what I'm going through. You're not, a, you know, no, no. So it's one of those places that you can literally connect with someone that's walked in your shoes and knows exactly what you're going through. Why do you think it is important that women have that platform to vent? There was, um, there's a really amazing thing on a TED Talks called Brene Brown and she talks about vulnerability. And um, one of the genius things which I didn't even see that until after Anonymous Wife Diaries launched was that you can't really be 100% yourself until you're actually vulnerable and you can tell people exactly what's on your mind or what you're going through. So I think that's what makes it so important is it's giving people an outlet to start to discover who they actually are instead of hiding behind who they think people want them to be, if that makes sense. <laughs> Was it quite easy to set up the website? No. <laughs> um, I don't design websites. Um, so when I came up with the idea, I kind of drew on a piece of paper. <laughs> oh, I think this is how I want it to look, but I don't know how to make the logo look or, uh, you know. So I talked to a friend of mine who's a great illustrator named Daniel Weck in Tauranga. And he sat down with me and he helped come up and everything I had visualized, he kind of created it for me initially. So he brought the whole project together. So yeah, that was really amazing. How does the website work? So the premise of it is that we have people that can leave whatever confession they want. It can be about your family, it can be about work, it can be about anything. They write a confession, they submit it. Uh, it doesn't get posted straight away and it gets moderated. So I go over everything to make sure that there's no bullying and that the integrity of the project is going how it should. Um, what makes it the most um, special is when people interact with these confessions. So. I really want people to give constructive feedback to help these people if they've been there, you know, and then to share the share the project with other people. Um, we're starting to feature blogs, so if people love to blog and they want their blog featured, they can submit that and we can post those. We're doing once a month. We're going to be doing a lot of really cool stuff too to make it more exciting. But um, I think the biggest thing they can do is, you know, write on there, you know, tell us what's on your mind, connect with other people around the world. Who are you aiming the website at? This website, we're aiming for women that right now are married, engaged, divorced, widowed, um, as kind of a platform. But we're not really, um, we're unbiased about it. Since it is the only project before the website launched, we did something on Facebook and Twitter. And we had men interacting saying, I need a wife's, 
you know, point of view, or I need a child, child would write and say, you know, how do I talk to my mom about this? So we're really not biased about it. Anyone can really write, as this is the only project we have at the moment, so yeah. You have a full-time job, you have a young toddler, she's autistic. I mean, how do you find the time to keep up with this website? Yeah, uh, <laughs> time's the hardest thing. I have a corporate job um, in, a, in a senior role, and so any spare time I have is all dedicated to the site. So I'm up at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm, you know, weekends is all dedicated to this to make sure that it's kind of going as planned. You're not advertising on the website. That was a, a big decision because I think advertising kind of takes away from the whole aspect of, of the project, which is helping people are not in it to make a quick dollar. Um, we are looking for sponsorships and, and things that way, but if I've got advertising flashing everywhere and stuff, then you know, it's not really beneficial and it's confusing. Where do you want to say that um, diaries go into the future? I would like to see it help and reach as many people as it possibly can, you know, around the world and build a brand for itself. So that's the place people go to. So what's the next step? The next step is the one that's the most important to me, which is Anonymous Teen Diaries, which we're working on now. Um, with the emergence of social media, bullying, um, you know, people struggling with identity as you're growing up, abuse, all these things that children go to, the suicide rate has skyrocketed in New Zealand, especially globally. So we're trying to create the same platform, but to ensure that it's helping teenagers and, and people around the world where they can come, you know, and say, you know, I feel like, you know, maybe they're struggling with a gender issue or identity or being bullied at school and contemplating suicide. Um, it's to set up a, a help place where people can, little teens can go and get advice from other teens saying, oh, look, I've been there. Now look where I am. So same type of concept, but more aimed at teens. You can confess all or give your advice at anonymouswifediaries.com. Just ahead, dog training tips. If you have just joined us, welcome to Central News. Dog attacks have been reported more widely in the media over the past decade, and some of us do fear what if our dog attacks someone or another dog. I went along to meet up with Wendy Graydon, the dog trainer, to do some training. Right, let's start at the beginning, Wendy. So how should we approach a strange dog? Well, there's your problem already. Approaching a strange dog is a big no. Absolutely not. In fact, going the other way would be a great idea. They're just dangerous. I mean, you don't know where it's been, or especially if it's just out on the road, um, or if it's um, coming in, out from a property, really dangerous. So, yeah, best not to um, approach a strange dog. Like, what about a dog with puppies? What about a dog tied up in the backyard? No, no, no. <laughs> not at all, yeah. Is there um, a best place to pat a dog? Yeah, preferably um, uh, around the shoulder and chest, um, under the chin type behaviour. Lots of people put their hand over the top and the dog lifts their nose and um, is tempted to either sniff or bite, depending on how comfortable they're feeling with that behaviour. But that's a normal behaviour, that's like a handshake for humans. Not good. So, is there something that we could be uh, teaching our children if they are around dogs in well, if public? There could be, if there could be a danger stranger for dogs, you know, a uh, stranger danger type thing, I would say it's just the same as a stranger with a bag of lollies. Don't even go there. Why would you? You don't know the dog. I mean, even if it's your uncle or aunties or cousins or friends dog, even then, um, children are so fragile and easily bitten, you know, and dogs can uh, misinterpret their twitchy little movements as, you know, something that needs a good nipping or sorting out, I'm afraid. And so is there something that, I mean, is there any way that we could be teaching our dogs to kind of be more tolerable around children or...? Sure, um, that's a training issue, like is my dog, you know, congenial, social, easy going. Um, when I have, um, you know, young people around I tend to put my dog away. It's just not worth the hassle, um, especially if they're not used to dogs. Like lots of children are growing up these days and they don't even have a dog or a pet or a rabbit or a budgie in their household. You know, we're living in these little tiny areas, you know. Is there a sign, like is there a warning sign that a dog gives that it's kind of feeling uncomfortable? Um, I think um, children are actually quite good at interpreting emotion um, in lots of ways, like the whites of the eyes are showing, the dog's ears are back. Uh, there's usually a warning growl, well not usually, sometimes, honestly, very unpredictable to know. A warning growl um, 
dogs often give that sort of whole stance, but sometimes children miss that, like uh, you've got it wrong type stance. They might notice it with their mum when she crosses her arms and, you know, that sort of thing. But um, it's not as a little bit more subtle with dogs and um, hard to interpret. But um, sometimes the eyes are a good giveaway. Now, say my dog is about to attack someone and it is attacking someone. Is there any stopping it? Is there anything I can do or is it just too late? Is that dog on dog or <laughs> dog on people? Either, I guess. Chicken. Either, I guess. Uh, uh, I mean, if your dog's reactive, that's a massive question. Uh, if the dog's reactive, it depends what's going on. Um, has it done it before? Um, dogs do things for all sorts of reasons, and so to stop a dog in full flight of attack, whew, you know, it can be hard work. Uh, there's lots of ways to do that, but I mean, I think you're looking at expert type behaviours <laughs> from people who know what they're doing. Mm. It's not, it's pretty much a... But it's what you get in the park every day, you know. Put your dog on a lead, you know. Bark, bark, fight, fight, scrap, you know. Off to the vet. You see that all the time in the parks, which is, you know, people not being uh, careful or using dog etiquette. If your dog's off lead, I can keep my dog off lead, we're OK. My dog's on lead, I'll put your dog, you can put your dog on lead. Just little etiquettes that, you know, you should be using in the park. But you never know, people go, my dog's friendly. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> right, that was the hard stuff. Let's go do a little bit of training. So Wendy, you were saying a good place to pat the dog is, it's not on the head, is it? No, it, yeah. so up here, and that, it just makes the dog come up straight away. That's how children get bitten, you know, so it's best to, to rub a dog down here on the shoulder, uh, under the chest, under the chin, they quite like that sort of uh, thing, but um, this sort of behaviour just makes dogs' noses and mouths come up to children's hands. It's best not to do that. Well, look at that difference, you know, look how calm she is. She feels it. a lot better that way. Now, what else do we do when we're trying to teach dogs to kind of behave? Behave. I think too that people forget that dogs are actually long. Like if you look at Lucy, she's actually this way, whereas we stand up straight. So if you want your dog to do something like sit, um, you just lift it up, lifting, um, uh, realizing that the dog's long, and if you lift over the nose, they will generally drop their tail. So it's sort of like this in behaviour, you know, instead of the stand up thing that we think. Same for when, you know, you're thinking about your dog going into a down. And at the moment, you know, I'm just using treats with Lucy, but you don't have to use treats. And it's all the way down, is right in front of you. Because if you move it forward too much, she'll move off her position, you know. So it's here, Lucy, sit, and Lucy down. So it's all here, Lucy, sit, Lucy down. Down, lovely. Good girl. Yeah, thank you. Visit the dogtrainer.co.nz if you would like some training tips. That is the news for today. We really want you to be involved, so like us on Facebook. Let us know your views. If you have news including your own video and photos, go to our website and hit upload. Thanks for joining us. I will be back tomorrow night with more guests from in and around our regions. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Have a lovely evening. Being an Alpha Media Production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.